what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And before I formally introduce to you today, Matt DeCourcy of FullScale.io. Matt, I always like to mention past episodes that would be interesting for people to check out. I was thinking, hmm, what's kind of relevant to today's guest? And thinking, um, check out our crowd. I uh, interviewed our crowd founder, Jonathan Medved, uh, talked about their equity crowdfunding platform that's raised more than a billion dollars from over 770 companies since its launch in 2013. Um, Zapier uh, founder, Wade uh, Foster, talks about growing Zapier, a tech company, and you'll see why this kind of plays a role in what we're going to talk about today. And many, many more. Check out inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships um, by helping you run your podcast. Uh, basically, Matt, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships and profiling the people and the companies I admire. And I found no better way over the past decade to have them on my podcast and shout out from the rooftops of what they're working on, what they're doing, and their cool stories that other people can learn from. So. If you've thought about starting a podcast, you should. If you have questions about it, go to rise25.com and email us, and we'll be talking about Matt's podcast as well. So, uh, and I want to just give a thank you to Jessica Powell, who made this happen uh, from the great team over at Full Scale, and uh, Dimitri Pezeroff, who introduced me to Jessica. So, um, you know, building a team of expert software developers is hard. Okay, everyone knows that. Anyone who's hired a software developer or tried to, it's not so easy. And that's why Matt DeCourcy and Matt Watson started Full Scale, and you can check it out at fullscale.io. They help software companies recruit, assess, retain, and employ experts. They have a staff of over 225 people and growing. Uh, Matt DeCourcy is a Kansas City based co founder and CEO of Full Scale, also co host of a Startup Hustle podcast. Congrats to them. I think they're approaching 2 million downloads, which is amazing. And um, as well as founder of Gigabook. And Gigabook is a provider of cloud-based business tools for small, medium-sized businesses. And he's a top-selling author. If he wasn't busy enough doing that, he's the author of Million Dollar Bedroom, Balance Me, as well as a co-author of The Realist Guide to a Successful Music Career. So I'm going to have to find out how does music relate to this tech world that he's in. And his co-founder, Matt Watson, um, after a $150 million exit from Vin Solutions, he founded Stackify to help developers improve application performance, and which had a second acquisition when uh, Netrio acquired Stackify. So Matt, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Let's start off with um, how did you originally meet Matt, your co-founder? I originally met Matt Watson after reaching out to him, looking for some peer-to-peer -peer advice uh, related to Gigabook. And at the, we started Gigabook amidst owning a different business. And as we exited that first business, I was more or less trying to figure out what I was going to do when I grew up, uh, or at least that's what it felt like. And I wanted some input from Matt. Matt's a highly successful uh, software founder. And uh, now that meeting went, by pretty quickly at a breakfast cafe. But when I really got to know Matt was when I included him to be interviewed in my book, Million Dollar Bedroom. And we became friends after that um, and kind of knew pretty quickly that we were meant to do something entrepreneurial together. So did you meet him just through the Kansas City ecosystem or how did you even know he existed? The straight up KC ecosystem, the Facebook page for startups in Kansas City. Mm. So then talk about the book for a second. So you interviewed him for the million dollar bedroom. What else? Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, well, so I've written three books. You, you were curious about the music connection. I'll, I'll hit that mm. uh, on, the, on the lap around. Uh, so I've written three books, Million Dollar Bedrooms, uh, what I refer to as my educational narrative. Um, so I used the story of starting a, a business in the extra bedroom in my home, had no money, had no experience, had a credit card with an $8,000 limit. 
and managed to turn that into $30 million in revenue over the subsequent seven to eight years that followed. Mm -hmm. It was also the precursor for everything we do now. That's where I hired my first employees in the Philippines, which later turned into full scale and did a bunch of other stuff. My other, I had another book, Balance Me, which is a realist guide to a successful life, which is uh, kind of a take on the fact that, well, one, work-life balance is a bit of a myth. It's different for all of us. And it's uh, about more than just work and life. It's about finding balance in your personal, professional, and physical life. And then before I was an entrepreneur, I worked in the music industry. I used to work for a company uh, named Roland. Roland's the world's largest maker of electronic musical instruments. And so I met a lot of interesting people along the way. Um, ended up wanting to do the, the realist guide to a successful music career was more of a passion project. But my connection to that, uh, so I have a lot of rock star co-authors, forward writers and interviews in that Uh I'm not a rock star. Like literally, lo hard. literally yeah. rock star. Yeah, yeah. I no. mean, I remember Dave Matthews Band wrote the foreword for that. Uh, my co-authors, nice. Joel Cummins from Humphreys McGee. There's all kinds of American Idol winners, Grammy Award winners, the music director for the Rolling Stones. But I wrote that from the perspective of being an entrepreneur because I actually believe that bands are startups too. 100%. And I mean, they have stuff. to hustle yeah. to get people oh, yeah. to their early yep. show. I mean, people see them on stage, yep. but... They were hustling kind of like comedians. They're probably at some, mm -hmm. you know, South Dakota, whatever gig they can get type of thing. It's a right? grind. It's a grind. And you overwhelmingly have a chance of failing before succeeding. And so some of that. So I wrote that with Joel and we kind of combined our skill sets and our knowledge uh, from that. It was, really was written from my perspective, like your band as a startup. And then I don't have 20 years of experience of selling out places like Red Rocks and stuff like that. So Joel had to kind of take over on that one. What should people learn, Matt, from bands? Like for acquiring customers, running their business? What, what did you take out of that experience in the music industry in that book? Well, for starters, uh, for me, a startup is anything that any business that doesn't come with an owner's manual. So, you know, that's the hardest thing about startups in general is it, literally they don't come with an owner's manual. If you need an owner's manual, buy a franchise. But there's a big difference between like I do believe some people don't think franchise owners are entrepreneurs. They're wrong. They are entrepreneurs, but they're not founders. That's a different that's a different feel. Um, but without that, like it's, it's just really like a lot of you're going to have to you're even the people that you see in the music industry that you think are famous will jokingly refer to themselves as the overnight sensation that was eight years in the making or something like everyone grinds it out and it's, and it's overwhelmingly ripe with failure and you need to know and understand that. But really the thing that I learned through that and also just my experience on the startup hustle podcast is that business is hard. And if you want to make a living out of something, you have to take it seriously and you need to get around the right people. And a band is much like a startup in that regard, meaning you got to go find co-founders and people that believe. And if you have one out of three people that sucks, well, then you suck too, because that means a third of your company sucks. Uh, it's just kind of the way it goes. And, you know, like the, it takes a lot of commitment, planning and perseverance. Are there any stories um, that stick out from the book, The Realist Guide? Um, whether it's from the Dave Matthews band or one of the other people, what, what's a fan favorite story from the book or maybe your, your favorite story? <laughs> I don't know if it's in the book, but okay. I will call my co-author out for admitting that he once fell off the stage into the orchestra pit at a show and that the other members of his band did not notice. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. yeah, he, he, uh, he told me, he told me after that, that, I said, well, what'd you do when you hit the ground? He said, I wanted to make sure I got back on stage before they realized they didn't need me up there at all. So, <laughs> no, totally. um, yeah, but uh, no, I mean, really Joel and, uh, you know, a lot of people have heard of the, the band Umphreys McGee and a lot haven't, but I mean, these guys have played tw almost 3000 live shows. So I, I just saw them in red at red rocks for a sold out audience. I mean, that's rock star stuff, but they did all the exact same stuff that people I know that run successful businesses do. They're down with their marketing. They control certain things and they 
also, you know, know that they're performers and they need to perform, meaning it's about the fans. It's about the community. What I really learned the most from Joel was to really focus on that tribe building aspect. And, mm. um, and, you know, you mentioned startup hustle. Um, you know, we are coming up on our two million download, just made it into the top 25 all time for entrepreneurship podcasts on Apple. And I'm humbled by that, you know, like, so like Joel says in the book and, and this, I feel the same way about our podcast, people can choose literally an infinite amount of things to do other than pay attention to what you're doing. So when they do get in there and interact and create a community that is about more than just you, you know, cause that's the true sense of tribe building is when the people that are following what you're doing find as much or preferably more value in some cases from each other than they do from you as, as the leader of the tribe or the initiator of the discussion. What made you shift Matt then from the music world to what was next for you? So yeah, I, I loved my experience at Roland, but that was back in the, the, it overlapped the same years that we refer to as the housing bubble, the financial crisis of 2000, you know, the, the late 2007, eight range. And um, as our business adjusted to that, my territory grew and I spent 150 nights in a hotel one year and I was in my early thirties and I was just like, you know what? I love this company. I love the industry, but I don't think I can live like this. So I knew I needed to make some changes and I didn't even know what, um, I applied to a top 10 business school, the uh, Kelly school of business in India, uh, at Indiana university. And also I wasn't expecting to get in and I did. Uh, so I quit my job and went back to school, uh, in my early thirties as mm. an adult and, uh, rapidly ran out of money. And I was looking for something to do. And uh, that's when I kind of stumbled on the business that I talk about in a uh, million dollar bedroom. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, when I look at do research, the books kind of follow a little bit of the evolution of your life and career, right? So you start off with the music career and then balance me. Talk about that for a second. You mentioned Balance no me such thing my, as that was actually my, oh, the, that was actually my first book. Oh, that was your first Music book. Music oh. industry was the last. Well, yeah. I, so I wrote Balance Me and Million Dollar Bedroom at the same time. And uh, I was working with an editor named Patrick Price and Patrick's uh, his crowning achievement is he's the one, he was the discoverer of the franchise that you remember he uh, he's just not that into you. What? No. It was a movie, a book. Oh, it the was movie. Huge. Oh, the movie. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. it was a book before it was a movie, but it had been passed. I just on didn't want to admit I'd seen people. it. Yeah. Matt, no. Well, it's okay. Uh, we, just... uh, I hadn't, I hadn't seen it until I met Patrick. Uh, <laughs> but he's been that he's been, you talk about getting around good people and getting good guidance. Um, he's been the editor, of like a dozen New York times bestsellers. So uh, with that, I, I employed him full time for six months and wrote those first two books. Um, Balance Me, I had worked on, I had concepted for a very long time and is, was kind of a model of, uh, I, you know, I want to say this in a, in a humble way, but um, it might come out different because sometimes that's the way it works. Um, I found a way as an entrepreneur and, and, uh, and a professional and just a person to grossly outperform uh, the average person in regards to getting things done. Right. So, uh, so the question, and the question was, is how, how did, how do you maintain all that? And I tried to get into that. And I, I quickly just realized that it was through understand having a, a, a strong sense of priority and understanding value, including like opportunity costs. Like whenever you choose to do one thing, you're choosing to not do something else. So part of what that book is about is about understanding that about yourself. Now, with three categories, with the three P's, personal, professional, and physical, you have your amount of effort that you put into all three categories. It's kind of funny because I've been a speaker on this. And the first thing I do is make people, I hand out paper and I say three, three columns, personal, professional, physical, what percentage of your effort goes into each? And then do it again, flip the paper over and now put which percentage of your effort you would like it 
you would like mm. your life to be because they're rarely if ever the same um and it's not there's no answer like your whatever makes you happy and feel balanced in that regard is different for me um you know i mean it's, i'm not saying don't work and it's not a one third one third one third kind of thing but in order to to get that balance back you first have to understand it and then you have to like begin to look at the things that you do in and around your life that literally have no value and replace them with things that do that move you towards a goal. And I, there's a score, the basic little scoring system in there and a whole lot of other stuff. And I mean, really in the end, I mean, in the first page of the book, it says, Hey, look, uh, you're probably your own problem. And if you're not willing to admit that, put the book back cause you won't like it and I'm not going to be able to help you. So some of it's just, some people love it and some people uh, don't because I mean, like I said, you got to kind of take responsibility for stuff. Yeah. Um, I feel like sometimes yeah, I mean, when you hold up, a, people hold up a mirror, it's tough, you know, and you have to face it. Right. Yep. Yep. You got to own it. And then also like some of it too, is just kind of really challenging yourself. Like, Hey folks, playing video games, it has no value for you unless you are a professional esports person that gets paid. And like some people literally like burn tens, if not have a full-time job playing call of duty. Or whatever. So if you're going to do that, and that's what you're going to choose to do. You can't on the other side of this walk across the other side of the street. And, Man, I'm just not getting what I want out of life. My career isn't moving forward. My my family is and this and that. Like, well, don't spend all your time ignoring them because you're playing video games. Um, I mean, if that's what you choose to do, that's fine. But know that you can get anything you want if you just literally start to work on it. I feel like, you know, we have different phases of life, right? And so, and you're growing a team, you're 225 growing to a thousand or more, right? Um, so maybe depending on where you're at in the phase of someone is the phase of career, those personal, professional, physical may be different. What, it, where does your, when you, when you look at that personal, professional, physical, are there anything you would change right now or tweak based on where you're at and where you want? I mean, it's almost for my answer for that, it's almost always physical, you know, cause it's more really physical. Easy to, you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Like I, meaning that's where, yeah. that's what's deficient on many days because it. it's easy to not eat right or not exercise or do a lot of different things. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the thing is, is the, that balance and what works for you, it evolves and changes over time. Like there's, uh, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, um, you're on many days only going to be as good as who you're married to or in a relationship with, meaning like they have to understand, like I have a very understanding wife. Like I can tell my wife, Hey, I'm going up to my office and I'm coming out when I come out. And I don't say that very often, but when I do, she knows that there's something like, I'm not going to be able to focus on other things and be present until I get certain things out of my head or done that are causing me anxiety. So, but that's that self-awareness and understanding. So some of that, you know, can lead to, you know, you, like I had to dial up the professional side of things when the pandemic hit. Cause I have, as you mentioned, 225 employees and that's a hell of a lot of pressure. And like, it's a lot of responsibility for my own family too, you know? So some of that, and then on the flip side, the pandemic, like today's, both of my kids are back at in-person school. And I looked over at my wife and I said, when was the last time you and me were in this house without either one of our kids? Exactly. And it was pre, it was pre pandemic. So, you know, like, so some of that I got, I mean, my kids are like best friends with each other. Now we get to spend a hell of maybe even too much time with each other. They were ready to go to school, man. They didn't even look back once we opened the door to the car. So what are the lessons <laughs> you talk to them about in a hold there, but uh, about, entrepreneurship and business. I'm sure you're talking around the, the dinner table about this stuff. So it, you know, I've always felt that I was born an entrepreneur and I see that in my daughter, especially who literally was trying to sell me stuff like when she was three and I never taught her how to do it. Like, you know, it was like, it, I, I see a lot of that. And then it was this inborn thing, thing with her. 
Yeah. Like, I mean, like she knows how to handle objections and do all kinds of stuff. I haven't pushed her on any of it. Like I, I, when she was three, you could ask her what every business needs and she'd say customers, you know, and then I'm like, wow. Get around the lines for full scale to start making calls. Yeah. Well, (laughs) she, she's probably now, who knows now my, my son's like a different personality. So my daughter's got the promoter aspect of me and my son's like more of a mathematician and like other stuff. So we'll see where that goes. But um, I haven't pushed them too hard. I try to teach them. I think at their age, they're four and a half and six and a half. And I'm trying to just teach them to be like respectful people (laughs) right now. That's, that's the main focus. Like uh, don't be an a-hole. Is basically what it comes <laughs> down good, to. Like that's a, a great it motto. It starts there because if we can't get that part right, then I don't think anything else matters. That's your next book on parenting, right? Um, don't be an a hole. I think being, someone ex- probably. I think someone wrote ex- that. Exactly. Already. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what I love to hear, Matt, um, which you are uniquely qualified to talk about this, uh, is the hiring process, right? I mean, mm. not just from your own company, but I mean, this is ultimately what you help other companies do by finding and vetting great talent um, for developers, right? So I love to hear some best practices on your your, your hiring process and, um, you know, talk about some best practices. I don't know anyone else that's hired more developers than me, to be honest. That's just because I don't know many people that have hired (laughs) hundreds. I know a lot of people that have hired some, but hundreds is a difference. So like what we do at full scale is, We actually use the acronym RARE. So we specialize in recruiting, assessing, retaining, and employing. So when our clients engage us, these are... So one of the things that people don't inherently understand about the American job market and economy right now is that the the talent shortage for tech is so pronounced that if entrepreneurs and businesses don't reach out, meaning like out of the borders of the US, they literally are going to fail in many regards. Uh, If entrepreneurs can't get what they want uh, in a price range that they need or a quantity that they need, it becomes really problematic. And there's about 350,000 open tech jobs right now in the US. Like I'm in Kansas City, the 25th biggest market in the US. And there's like almost 5,000 openings just here. And that becomes really problematic. So the question, so you realize that you can use offshore or remote talent. The problem is, is how do you know if they're any good or like any of it? Like, how do you know how to do any of it? So, and then there's other concerns too, that some people don't think about before using companies not like ours. Like, do you have any recourse if this person runs off with your intellectual property? and stuff like that. So Full Scale was started because Matt Watson, my business partner, had a company, Stackify, that was having all these problems. And we became business partners actually in gigabook.com first. And when other entrepreneurs who had been listening to Startup Hustle were like, hey, how do we find some developers in the Philippines like you guys? We were like, huh. So we started, we started offering this and creating this offering. Now, with that, we were decent at hiring, but we had to get good at it really quickly. So when it comes to tech talent, there's a whole lot of different things because just because you can write code doesn't mean you're going to be a good employee and it doesn't mean you'll be successful or productive either. Like there's a lot of people that can write code, but they're terrible communicators or they're just not passionate. So when we look at hiring for tech talent, we've created around 40 different of, of our own skill assessments. Now, our goal is to hire the top 3% of people we find. That's 3%. So one out of 33 is, about, and we're, we're actually, it's harder than that. We're actually tighter than that. But in order to do that, we created these assessments to first kind of screen out people. Like, if you can't pass a basic coding test for what you're applying for, then uh, then we, we will move on. We need to keep that efficient for ourselves. But it helps us identify people's talent across a whole lot of different things. Like some, some developers are what we call polyglots, meaning they're linguists. They know how to do a lot of different stuff and they'll figure it out quickly. So we do have, our assessments range from true coding tests to things like problem solving, algorithms, like you name it. Now, here's the thing. That only gives you about half the story. 
So there's a whole nother branch of stuff that we have to get into related to like who the person is. So when we have the ability to know what someone's passionate about and that matches the need and they, and they can do the job and they're passionate about it, when we match them up with a client that's doing that, oh, magic happens. Mm. Magic happens. Those are the people we literally have to tell, hey, you can't work 300 hours a month. You're going to kill yourself. But they love it. It's not work. That's, I, that's the way I look at being an entrepreneur. You know, I decided like almost 20 years ago that I was going to make that making money was now my hobby. And I, dude, I haven't worked a single day since I made that decision. So, cause I'm passionate about it. I like it, right? But the same thing with developers. So it comes down to some other things too. The other side of the personal coin is like, what's your industry experience? What are you passionate about? Do you have critical thinking skills or a big part? So, you know, when you talk about the dynamic of, of an offshore worker, you have to be highly empathetic of culture. And that culture in the Philippines or South America or Eastern Europe, it's all different, right? So in a lot of these countries, it's considered risky, dumb, or rude to tell your boss no, which leads to major, major breakdowns in critical thinking. Like you can give someone a blueprint. It would be the equivalent of giving a contractor, a, home, a house, at, like a home builder, a contract. He looks at it and says, man, this is going to fall over after I build it. Yeah, but it'd be rude for me to say something. So I'll just build it anyway. <laughs> and that's where, that's where people fail yeah. with offshore. And also just like a basic understanding of how to hire people, who to hire, and things like intellectual property protection and just like a whole lot. And another thing you got to realize too is the very, very best people you're going to find, they aren't in per and pay by the hour online marketplaces. They want to work for companies that, work with the kind of clients that we do and have culture. They want stability. They want all of that. And they want to work around other people who are also awesome. So that's, I mean, that's basically what, what we're working on. And then the thing is, is that also can break down too, because now when you get to that side of things, these are judgments that a person, a person needs to make. Not a, not a score on an assessment, but someone else. So like, yeah, so we've had to create a whole process for that, make it efficient, make it automated. Think about how fast we've grown. So we've literally had thousands and thousands of, of applicants. So you got to go through those. And that's, we've built, a, we've built our own system at full scale to do everything from, like we use Gigabook for the appointment setting. Uh, we actually deploy our, our uh our tests through hacker rank. And if you really just want to like, if you just need to, that's a great platform that has some built-in tests, but you know, part of that too, if you're going to assess someone, don't just ask them trivia questions, give them a test where they actually have to do it. Like there's a big difference bet between being able to actually drive a car and pass and passing the written driving test. I could totally. probably teach my seven-year-old how to pass the written driving the, like the written part of the driver's license test, but you don't want them behind the wheel of a car either. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's some of it. The, the, the hard part is still the, uh, the whole act of uh, putting it all together and getting people to communicate with each other. And just there, there's a lot to that too. There's two things, Matt, I want to dig a little bit more into one. You mentioned clients wise and passion. So I want to talk a little bit about the types of industry and the types of companies who are ideal to work with you. I also want to dig into um, key positions. Um, I mean, you, you grew really quickly um, in a couple of years and you're continuing to grow quickly. Um, what are some of the key positions early on from like zero to 200 people that you were in, you know, key in you growing? Well, let's actually start with what you don't want. Because part of it is knowing what you don't want to occur and then doing everything you can in your power to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so we admittedly had some leadership uh, in the Philippines. We made leadership changes early because we didn't want, we were trying to do something different. Um, and um, we didn't want to, we, we wanted experienced leaders and people that knew how to own and operate a business, but we had to be very careful that we weren't importing the crap culture that they may have been involved with at other businesses. Um, and, you know, that dynamics change. So like for us, it was really important to create a culture around winning, uh, also around learning. 
and, you know, like that critical thinking component and wanting to get better. And like some of that was also defining like what's our what's our purpose driven uh, like thing. And our purpose is to help our clients succeed. So that's why we wake up every day. And when we're doing that, you're going to have a lot of autonomy. Like people that have 15 years of experience don't want to be micromanaged. If they're good and you hire them, let them do their work. So, you know, creating cultures where that was the case. Um, and then some of it too is just like, I mean, just also just having people with the right attitude. Um, and, you know, so making sure that that occurred as far as key positions, uh, fortunately, I've, our, our COO um, has worked with me at other companies. So I got to have a, a running partner there. Uh, Matt Watson was still very involved with Stackify and, it's, and still is even after acquisition. Um, and he's done everything he could to offer his skills. But when it comes to key positions, if you get the right mix of people, and you know what your roles are, then get to work, you know, get to work and, and, and no, but you also have to create like levels of accountability that are like, Hey, so we use the term world-class. That's like our, that's what we want our standard to be. Like if whatever we're putting out isn't world-class, like we, we have free reign and license to call the other out on it. Hey man, this is not world-class. And holding that accountability. And, you know, you asked me before we hit record a couple things, like what, like what is on the forefront of my mind when it comes to full scale. The thing that keeps me up at night is, you know, the, well, first off at 200 and we'll have 300 employees by the end of the year, most likely, I mean, the end of 2021. Uh, and we're on pace to have a thousand employees. Now we're not going to get there if we don't start acting and being that company now. Because and if we do manage to get there by any any, it's almost I'm not a big believer in luck. But if we do manage to get there, the mess that we'll have to clean up by not thinking like the thousand person company now is going to create a different set of pain and emotion that at 46 years old I would prefer to not experience anymore. I mean, so talk, the, the, yeah. it, that's hard. Though. That's hard, though, because, look, if you're going to be at 225 employees three years later and millions of dollars of revenue, you don't get there without moving fast and breaking a few things along the way. So is this worth gluing back together? Is this like, shit, we better stop everything we're doing and do this? Like, there's a lot to consider. What are some decisions you make or the team makes now, considering that that you're like, maybe if you were functioning as in the present as a 200 person team, but thinking we are going to be functioning as a thousand person team, what's the decision you made go, we need to use the, whatever this process, this software, because we're going to be here in a couple of years. So that we have made a heavy investment into building our own system. And that's the thing is we are wanting to, we're trying to, we, we like to say that full scales by founders for founders. Right. Like we, I can, as a founder, I can look at another founder and say, Hey dude, I know what it's like to wake up at two in the morning and wonder if I'm going broke, if I'm going crazy or maybe both. <laughs> and so, so much of what we built and the experience is about making it fast, easy and affordable, like pain-free to do things. But we also have to do the same thing on the other side for our employees. So we've created a system that I refer to as circular communication. And I think that that's a key ingredient because the three, the parts of that circle, we have full scale US, we have full scale in the Philippines, we have our employees and we have our clients. And that has to be a symbiotic cycle that the communication doesn't just flow in one direction, but can go either direction quickly and fluidly. Um, and then part of that, what you have to consider too, is like, uh, if I'll give you an example. So at Stackify, Watson used 15.5, but that's a pretty expensive thing for me to scale across hundreds and hundreds of people. So sometimes you got to look at some of the stuff you're like, holy shit, like, sorry, am I allowed to say that on this show? But um, you can't have an entrepreneur show and not be able to swear. Um, you need to release it somehow. Be, it, 
Yeah. It would be challenging. That was that was the best question I ever asked in the Startup Hustle Facebook chat is what has an entre- being an entrepreneur taught you? And someone said, how many ways I can use the F word in a sentence? <laughs> um, yeah. So, so some of the growth thing is, you know, you always have that if you're a technologist or you build software or anything, you always have that buy versus build question. So, mm. You know, some you of you guys it do because, a good episode you know, about that, actually, a buy versus build on. Uh, thank you. I saw it on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So it's some funny it because it's like, almost like uh, counterintuitive because like, oh, obviously he's going to say build because they run full scale. No. And but, oh, no. but the no. case is there's, you know, which I love the balanced approach to the episode, which is there's cases where you should buy and cases where you should build. So, yeah. And you got to th- you got to think about where you're going to be later, too, because like I, we mentioned the time clock. I end that episode. I remember that. And even things like Gigabook. So we use Gigabook for all of our appointment scheduling. Now here's the thing with a thousand employees, even at some enterprise rate, that could be five, 10, $15,000 a month on top of Google suite, Slack, a whole bunch of other stuff. So some of that, you got to think about where you are and where you want to be. You also don't want to slow things down because, you know, if you want to get to the top of the mountain, you got to drag all the things that you decide to do along the way and your backpack to the top. So the more stuff you build, like you, if you're not going to support it, you're better off renting it and letting someone else build it. So like a good example is, is type form. So type form, I don't know if you're familiar with it, oh, but yeah, let you, yeah, totally. Yeah. Super slick, great UI for collecting forms and stuff like that. Easy to change on the fly, pre-integrates with a ton of stuff. I get 10,000 forms filled out in a month, which I've never even come close to that. I think it's 50 bucks. I can't outbuild that. Like, so we're, so you can leverage certain things. So we use Typeform and connect that to our company system, which means I don't have to deal with an updated user interface because for 50 bucks a month, man, like, unless you can build it like tomorrow, it's going to be hard for me to outsave that. But then you have things like time clocks or like, you know, so, and some things are free, like Calendly is a competitor of Gigabook. Technically, we do different things, but there's some shit that's just free, like Zoom. Like you'd be dumb to try to build your own video conferencing. We're using Zoom right now. And it'd be like you saying, hey, you know what? I love my podcast. I think I'll build my own video thing right, for exactly. it. You know, it's like, eh. So, I mean, that's part of what you're thinking about. But yeah, we're building our own system. And a lot of that's intended to also, uh, uh, you know, kind of turn into a self-service kind of thing. Because as a founder to another founder, like, I don't want to call you to ask you pretty much anything. So why can't I do this here in your site? Now, we'll see how that comes out. Because on some days, it's, some days it's great and some days it's not. You know, you have this this capacity to do whatever you want because you have all this talent and because you help hire all this talent. Do you think at some point full scale will come out with um, a specific software solution that you, you know, let's say you release that the circular, you know, communication system to other people? Do you think anything will offshoot from that that you will release as a product or you're not really thinking in that realm. It's, it's, it's a possibility. We've actually had multiple people inquire about usage of, so we call it the rocks system, largely because it's located at full scale dot rocks. And if you go there, you're just going to find a portal, like a sign in portal. That's it. Like, cause it's not like it's, it's, it's intentionally not commercially viable in that regard. Um, I mean, it's a possibility. It's something we've looked at. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'm gaining experience at 46 years old. And I think one of the things that I've really come to appreciate is not chasing all the shiny things. So like when you get on top of the gold, your, your number one mission should be to dig gold out of the ground and not everything else. And it's really easy to get enamored with a ton of different stuff. So the, the, uh, the byproduct of building the system is a lot of framework and a lot of stuff that is commercially viable, but Mm -hmm. until the, until the process of like, we're, I mean, I can't even keep developers in stock. I mean, that's until that slows down. I I just want to be amazing at that. Yeah. Just hold on and, and go for the ride. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I love that. And I encourage people to check out your podcast, um, Startup Hustle, and 
you know, the videos on YouTube and, and I was, you know, watching the buy versus build. And one of the, one of the interviews I had was with um, Mobileye, one of the uh, founding engineers at Mobileye, which is kind of an, it fuels the autonomous vehicle thing. But um, it was interesting because Intel ended up buying them for $15.3 billion and they were going through the same thought, which is, hmm, in this whole car, there's only one chip that we don't make in this car. And Mm, uh, we should maybe create it, right? And they decided that it's cheap. It was cheaper for them to pay fifteen point three billion dollars than to try and create it themselves. So yep. all companies are thinking like this. Um, let's talk, you know, Matt, about the client industry. Who are ideal industries, ideal customers to be saying, "Listen, we need to be going to full scale .io right now and checking out what they are doing." So we say no to more clients than we say yes to. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because, like I said, we see it. It's that circular pattern. Like if I don't think you're going to treat our employees well, or if I think you're a pain in the butt, I'll just say next. My favorite four letter words other than one that starts with F is next and sold. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like sometimes you just got to move along because you know, certain we've learned that certain types. Uh, so we want companies that, quote, know what they're doing. Um, so like, for example, if you're a decking contractor and you want to build an app and you've never built software and you're not available all day because you're swinging a hammer, we're not the right. We're not the right company for you. We don't do any statement of work contracts like our deliverables, our time and our, our team members report directly to our clients. Um, on paper, our fastest growing clients have between 11 and 50 employees. Uh, they're usually venture backed. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't work with people that aren't, but those are the ones that grow the fastest because if you have to suddenly hire an uh, engineering team of 12 people, good luck. Just good, seriously, good luck. And we oftentimes, like I signed up a new client today that's starting with six people. And he the guy literally told me, he's like, I just can't find these people at this, at this level of quality anywhere, especially in one stop. Um, now, the thing that's created this massive tech talent shortage is the fact that businesses that weren't traditionally building software suddenly are all over the place. So, you know, we have some clients that have large, like double digit member teams that are literally building systems, kind of like I defined for art, like us, their own management system, because it's their, it's, it gives them the ability to have control and do the things that they want or for whatever reason that they're doing it. But overwhelmingly, our clients are software as a service companies and, uh, and they're looking for expert people. Favorite, um, podcast episodes people should check out from startup hustle of startup hustle yeah you know it's funny because i get this question a lot and i never know what to answer because it kind of depends on when you ask i mean some of my favorite episodes are the ones that i've done with sandy kemper um sandy kemper's a, a staple of the entrepreneur community in kansas city um he's the founder of c2fo and just one of those people that after I talk to him, I'm like, God, I got a lot of stuff to learn still. Um, I got another, there's another, uh, a couple episodes that I've recorded with a guy named Ron Shigeta, who has got like PhDs and master's degrees from like the entire Ivy League. And he's, uh, he's invested in a bunch of different companies. And, and you know, funny thing, he's not even a software guy. Um, but, uh, you know, just, I enjoy the, I enjoy the learning. Uh, experience. And then uh, personally, I, 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 I do squeeze some musician episodes in because um, I like to. So I've had some with my co-author, Joel Cummins. And uh, what I'm really enjoying right now is Watson and I have been doing a we're doing a 52 part series about how to build a tech company, which is uh, which is funny because we're three weeks behind on on it which which we've been That's laughing pretty fitting, like, right people are yeah, we're like there's the real, like hey people there's probably nothing we could do to demonstrate <laughs> <laughs> what you're going to run into <laughs> than clearly missing your deadline and maybe being overextended on your burn rate so there you go yeah i love it check it out everyone check out the startup hustle podcast um 
Last question, uh, Matt, and first of all, thank you. Thank you for sharing your lessons, stories, knowledge. Everyone can go to fullscale.io, check out the Startup Hustle podcast and the episodes there. Um, any other places we should point people online to check out more? More Startup Hustle stuff? Yeah, and just, yeah, in general, yeah. or those are the two best um, places. Well, if, if you're interested in being a guest on the show or suggesting one, you can go to startuphustle.xyz and fill out the form, which is a type form, by the way. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, and if you want to check out our web series, uh, which is kind of a newer thing for us that we've been experimenting with, uh, you can just go to pretty much go anywhere and type in Startup Hustle. That's on YouTube. Um, you know, one of the things that I enjoy is the is the interaction we have with other entrepreneurs in the Startup Hustle chat on and on Facebook. So uh, there's a couple thousand people in there, and uh, we we keep it clean, man. It's not filled with a bunch of people spamming crap. Um, so we police it pretty hard, which, so it's not highly active. I mean, there's a post or two every couple of days, but try to ask polls and different things that could be inherently useful or just help other people understand things about their own business. Like I just did a poll recently asking like how many new clients in a month, new clients or users in a month is good at your business. Cause it gives you a perspective. Like there's people that are like one and some people are like hundreds. So, but that's a big difference. That's a big difference. And I think that that's fun. I think if you're a, a real entrepreneur, uh, truly, truly passionate about it, then you're a nerd about it. So you kind of scoop all that stuff up and, and want it. you find it interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Last question is, um, you know, you mentioned Typeform and I would love to hear your favorite tools and software. People probably ask you this all the time or geek out on people's other people's tech stacks and what they use. What are some of your favorite tools and software uh, outside of, obviously you mentioned Typeform. Slack, without a doubt. Um, I feel a little lost without it. And I know there's other products that, that do it, but that's the one that does it for me. Um, honestly, I was just talking the other day with my wife about, and this is like, this is like so, a boring answer. How about Google Suite? Like professionally for $5 a month, like, and, and sorry, Microsoft, I'm not renewing my Excel license or my Word license or any of that other stuff because it's in there. And, you know, one of the things with that, that's like, I've just really, I I've probably have a cluttered rat's nest of a Google Drive. But if I know I'm always putting it in there, it makes it really easy for me to find it wherever I'm at. Um, I, I, Gigabook, our own tool, uh, I would have a difficult time living without it on many days. It's kind of like the ease of use. Like, and you, you were using a different product when I scheduled this, but like, think about how much back and forth you go through without any booking. Like, I don't care if you use Gigabook or whatever. If you're Talk not about like, Gigabook actually, for a second. How can people? It's it's, you know. it, it's Calendly on steroids, basically. I mean, you can still uh, you can do everything from build like a link tree in it and embed it on your website. Uh, reminders, notifications. You can take payments. Does texting, emails, and the thing with Gigabook is it's fully customizable. So we built Gigabook for all of the industries that don't have an industry specific booking platform. So like if you're a hairstylist, you're gonna hate it. It's not built for what you do. It's built for like. I mean, we, we have an exorcist that actually had a Gigabook account and you could book your exorcism online with that. But there wasn't, there's no industry platform for exorcism booking. Not that I uh, but, the th but people want to come in and customize that and be able to have a little more control and do different stuff. So it's been pretty interesting. And, you know, I, no software is going to do everything you need it to do. I love it. Matt, thank you. I want to be the first one to thank you so much. Everyone check out fullscale.io, check out Startup Hustle and much more. And uh, we'll see you again in the next, uh, next time, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Awesome. Thanks. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.